Welcome everybody to today's micro lecture on EU history. As you can see, uh, today's lecture is structured in the following way. I will first tell you uh, about the idea why the European, European Union has been founded. Uh, I will then uh, tell you about uh, the Schumann Declaration uh, and the so-called spillover effect. And uh, we will look at EU history from the two perspectives of new member states uh, joining the EU, but also uh, this idea of transferring more competences to EU level, um, so treaty revisions. As always, uh, there are several guiding questions and you can by now already reflect on those questions, but uh, as you know, they will also be answered by the end of today's lecture. So what is the main purpose uh, for starting EU integration and how was this purpose achieved? What is the so-called uh, already mentioned spillover effect and uh, how did EU integration further develop? As you can see, uh, we have uh, several uh, founding fathers of the European Union. I, uh, I will not focus on all of them, but uh, on the two persons that you can see on uh, the bottom of the slide. Chaumonet, he was a French civil servant who has drafted the idea for founding the European Union. You have to know that after the First World War, uh, Germany was punished, they had to uh, make certain payments because they do, were the ones to lose the war. Uh, so after the Second World War, uh, Chaumonet was very clever in realizing that if you do the same mistake again, meaning again if you punish Germany and if you would create a lot of uh, anger in the German population, this on the long run could lead to World War III. So he decided to do it in a different way and uh, instead of punishing Germans, Germany, he had the idea to work together in the field of coal and steel. Why coal and steel? Because at the time coal and steel were the main uh, resources that you, that you would need for fighting a war, building tanks and all that. So the idea was to work together in the field of coal and steel to transfer the competence for those resources to the European level uh, and therefore war would be simply impossible. Um, Chaumonet was uh, the one to develop this idea. Robert Schumann, he was the French foreign minister at the time and he uh, presented this idea. It was mainly addressed to Germany but not only and that was uh, the starting point of European integration. If you look at this picture, everyone knows what happens if you cook milk. It will spill over once uh, the heat uh, increases. And uh, the very same effect took place with European integration. So at the beginning, the level of milk was very low. But working together in one field automatically led to the necessity also to work together in other fields. And uh, I think that was also a very clever idea of uh, Chaumonet, respectively Robert Schumann, to make countries who have been opposing in wars for, for decades, uh, to, put or to bring them together on the long run and to uh, make them work together uh, so that they would have disputes uh, on conference tables but not on battlefields. Um, it was mentioned uh, that there are founding fathers. Uh, uh, also to tell you that there is also a founding mother, not of the European Union, but of this uh, Chaumonet program, which uh, also provides for those uh, Chaumonet chairs. Uh, Jacqueline Lastenus, uh, she can be seen as the founding mother of this Chaumonet program, and Chaumonet and Robert Schumann, the founding fathers of EU integration as such. If we look into uh, this um, declaration that uh, Robert Schumann gave on the 5th of May 1950, you can see some of the ideas uh, that are part of this declaration. So first of all, uh, what you can see on, on the uh, bottom of the slide, the idea is if those countries work together, starting with coal and steel, again, which is necessary or was necessary, especially at the time, to fight wars. So if they work together, then war becomes, uh, as it's mentioned here, materially impossible. 
On the other hand, uh, this Schumann Declaration of 1950 very well describes the integration process up until today because uh, it's a step-by-step -step, uh, approach. So it's not that he already uh, had a blueprint what the European Union would look like in, I don't know, 50 years, but it's a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, progress and again, that's also still valid uh, up until uh, today. So here you can see uh, the symbols of the European Union. So as I've just mentioned, uh, the 9th of May 1950, that was the day when Robert Schumann gave uh, this famous speech in the Salon de l'Horloge, uh, this, um, um, this famous room uh, in, in Paris. Uh, that's why the 9th of May since then is uh, considered Europe Day, so the founding day of Europe, so to say. You can also see the European uh, flag, uh, the euro, which is the currency not of all, but of some member states, the European anthem. And I think uh, very important, or let's say very representative, the motto of the European Union, which is united in diversity. Um, very representative, I would say, because um, of course, the European Union strives to have more unity or, or more uniform solutions. For, exam for example, the idea of creating a single European market. But at the same time, it's a um, description of the status quo because in some fields, uh, the law or also the society in the European Union is still diverse. So therefore, united in diversity very much uh, reflects those two elements. Now, EU history means that uh, what has started between Germany and France at the time, and not, as you can see on, on, uh, on the map, it was not only France and Germany, also Italy was a founding member state uh, together with the Benelux countries, Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg. And then this idea has further developed on two levels. What you can see here on, uh, on this slide is the increase in number of member states. So what started with six member states in the 1950s uh, was enlarged in 1973 uh, via the United Kingdom, uh, the Republic of Ireland and Denmark. And if you just look at the, um, at the map, so two countries, who, who so the, the Northern Ireland part of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland in the south, so it was very important at the time that both countries joined at the same time because otherwise there would be a, an external border. And nowadays with Brexit, that's precisely uh, the challenge uh, that um, has to be dealt with in this situation of Brexit, that if the northern part uh, quits uh, or exits the EU, but not the southern part, the Republic of Ireland, that obviously can create a lot of uh, disturbances. Then in 1981, Greece joined, so we call that the Southern Enlargement, and also in the south uh, of Europe, Spain uh, and Portugal in 1986. 1995, we then had Austria, uh, Sweden and Finland to join the European Union. Uh, the same idea that I just mentioned with regard to Northern Ireland would also apply to uh, the Nordic countries. So also Norway, if you look at the map, initially should have joined the European Union, but there was a referendum in, Nor in uh, Norway, so the people spoke out against uh, this idea of joining the European Union. That is why Norway did not join the EU in 1995. 2004, we then had the, f uh, the big uh, so-called Eastern European enlargement. So you can see a lot of those Eastern European countries joined together with Malta in the Mediterranean and uh, Cyprus. Uh, then another Eastern European enlargement in 2007, so Romania and Bulgaria, and the last country that uh, joined the European Union, uh, Croatia. Uh, as it's mentioned on the slide, those treaties, those accession treaties, uh, including those new member states, they are also part of primary law, the same as here on the next slide, uh, the so-called revision treaties, they are also part of EU primary law. So those are treaties that revised the founding treaties and added new elements, maybe new institutions, 
new rules for institutions, new sectoral, sectoral policies, so the fields of activities of the European Union. So that's precisely this uh, 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 spillover effect that I mentioned at the beginning. So adding more elements to the European Union, that was mainly done via these uh, revision treaties. As you can see, we, ha uh, we have here on the slide the European Coal and Steel uh, Community Treaty, then uh, those other treaties, and then most of the time uh, those treaties are named according to the cities where they have been signed. So here in 2007 it was signed, in 2009 it entered in the force, the Lisbon Treaty, which brought some very important changes to the European Union. So again, here on, on this slide we have the uh, the, the hierarchy of EU law, so we have EU primary law, which uh, is done by all 28 member states, EU secondary law, which uh, is enacted by EU institutions, Parliament, Council, uh, based on a proposal of the European Commission. And it's very important to emphasize that EU primary law, which is accession of new member states, accession treaties, but also revision treaties, adding new elements to the European Union, so not member states, but content. Uh, both uh, examples, or, or, or bo yeah, both examples of bringing forward EU integration. That's EU primary law, which means all member states, uh, all uh, in terms of unanimity, they have to agree to those changes. Um, if we look at the uh, vertical distribution of competences. So if based on the spillover, spillover effect, uh, EU member states agree that there is a necessity to add new fields to the European Union or maybe to turn one field, which was only maybe a shared competence, into an exclusive competence. So everything that uh, should happen in order to bring forward EU integration uh, that uh, uh, if that's based on the spillover effect, that has to be done via the changing of EU primary law. So, now you hopefully know uh, what was the main purpose for starting EU integration. So it's very important to emphasize, even today, that the objective was to safeguard bees. And nowadays, in a re retrospective view, we can clearly say that this uh, project was successful. So we have had the longest period of peace in EU history. So that was the objective. How was it done? So the methodology, if you like, uh, it was done by making countries working together on an economic level at the beginning. And so by bringing their economies, their law, uh, and also society more closer together, that made war uh, literally impossible. And uh, this intense way of working together, or if we go back to this picture of uh, the, the cooking milk, uh, so the high level of milk that we have nowadays, that's precisely also uh, one reason why Brexit proves to be uh, very difficult. This spillover effect again means that if you cooperate, if you work together in one field, this will automatically lead to the necessity to work together in also in other fields. So for instance, if we have free movement of workers, uh, just the legal possibility that people can work in other member states of the EU, that of course will also lead to the necessity to uh, work on questions of healthcare, emergency care, planned uh, care, uh, you will have to uh, think about uh, coordinating uh, the law of social security, pension rights. So would those uh, workers later on get pension payments? What does that look like? So that's the spillover from one economic field to another economic. But we have also seen, that was especially in 1992 with the Maastricht Treaty, we have also seen the spillover from the economic field to the political field. So working together also on a political level, so the common foreign and security policy, but also adding the euro as a single currency. As you know, not of all member states, but of some. Um, the history or the development of European integration can mainly be described in terms of more countries joining uh, this uh, idea, this project, but also content-wise adding new elements to European uh, uh, integration, so new fields of activities, uh, sectoral policies, as it is called. So, 
now you hopefully know more about EU history. Uh, thanks for watching.